The Quran makes the claim in 25:53 that fresh water and sea water will never mix because Allah has set a permanent barrier between the two. And he it is who has let flow forth the two large bodies of water, one sweet and palatable and the other salty and bitter, and he has set a barrier and an insurmountable forbidding ban that keeps them apart. Quran 2161 reiterates who made the earth a place of settlement, caused rivers to flow through it, placed firm mountains upon it, and set a barrier between the two bodies of water. Was it another God besides Allah? Absolutely not, but most of them do not know. Quran 55, 19-20 says, He merges the two bodies of water, yet between them is a barrier they never cross. The verses emphasize the two waters, salt and fresh, will not mix due to a barrier put between them by Allah. Verse 25-53 is more clear and emphatic in its statement about the permanence of this barrier and what the two waters actually are. Popular videos such as this are often promoted making the Islamic miracle claim about the barrier between sweet and salt waters. The link is in the description. Please view the video to hear the claims. Often pictures such as this are circulated to prove the so-called truth of the Quranic claim that the two bodies of water do not mix and how this is proof that the Quran is divine due to its prediction. There are two main flaws in this argument. Firstly, in ancient times people travelled by sea, including the Arabs, and the separation between the two waters was observable to the people as it is today. There is a clear contrast of colour between the two bodies of water. This contrast gives the impression there is a permanent barrier between the two waters. If something is an observable phenomenon as it is in this picture, then the Quranic claim is not a miracle. Secondly, the idea that the two bodies of water will never mix and are set apart by a permanent barrier is not true, as will be explained next. What the picture does not show or explain is the cause of the vertical stratification is mainly attributed to the difference in density between the two waters in that they have different mineral content and different temperatures. Further, the river water picks up and carries sediment. What is observed in the picture is the freshwater discharge of a major river into the ocean. The darker water on the right is the higher density salt water, whereas the lighter water on the left is fresh water filled with sediment from the river. In other words, the contrast is because of the sediment as well as the density differences which allows the fresh water to remain on top of the salty water for some time, before eventually mixing much further out to sea. The point is, the picture is absolutely not showing the two waters refusing to mix. The waters do end up mixing as they slowly find a new equilibrium, so the borders are not static or permanent at all, as they will constantly transform and even disappear. This is what it looks like from the air at a larger scale. The salt ocean has tides, and at a tidal estuary where a river meets the ocean, there are various possibilities for the flow. River flow may be faster than, equal to, or slower than the tidal flow, and the nature of the mixing of the waters depends on which of these cases exist. In this academic website called Water Encyclopedia, with the title Ocean Mixing, award-winning researcher and oceanographer Professor Piers Chapman, who has the distinction of having a marine basin named after him and holds numerous other awards and honours, evidences how the two bodies of waters mix by saying, 
Mixing in the ocean occurs on several scales. The smallest scale being molecular. If a layer of warm, salty water lies above a layer of colder, fresher water, the heat and salt will tend to diffuse downwards to make a single layer with intermediate temperature and salinity values. He goes on to say, most mixing, however, takes place on larger scales in response to forcing by the wind, by tides or by currents. The full link to the article is in the description. As far back in ancient Greece, thinkers such as Archimedes understood the reason for this phenomenon of mixing waters. For example, due to density differentiation in that salt water is denser than fresh water. So according to the Archimedes principle, it states the buoyant force applied by the fluid is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid and is represented by the following formula. What this means is fresh water can float on salt water for a while until diffusion ultimately mixes the fresh and salty layers uniformly. As the river flow is faster than tidal flow, it is possible therefore to temporarily have a slanted configuration in which salt water flows in under the fresh water flowing out, thus giving the impression and appearance of the surface as if fresh water is suddenly meeting salt water at the border. Nevertheless, there is actually mixing eventually. In fact, the scientific community and academic researchers do accept that salt water and fresh water do actually mix in a phenomena known as brackish water. Here is a picture of brackish water with an explanation from a water equipment company. The water is also mixed within estuaries as explained in the National Ocean Service website. The links to both the sources are in the description. Although the idea that the two waters never mix is not correct, the Quranic claim that there is a permanent barrier between fresh and salt water is not new either, as it originally came from an ancient myth believed by the Sumerians, Akkadians and the Babylonians. The point is, if it's a miracle claim for Muslim apologists, then it is also a miracle claim made by people who followed pagan religions thousands of years before Islam. For example, in the Babylonian creation epic called the Enuma Elish, in one of the stories about Abzu, a primal being made of fresh water, and his lover, another primal deity called Tiamat, a creature of salt water, the Enuma Elish begins by saying, when above the heavens did not yet exist, nor the earth below, Absu, the freshwater ocean, was there. The first, the begetter, and Tiamat, the saltwater sea, she who bore them all. They were still mixing their waters, and no pasture land had yet been formed, nor even a reed marsh. Called the myth of Absu, the two waters became permanently separate after the creation. The fresh water was given a religious quality in Sumerian, Akkadian and Babylonian mythology whereby lakes, springs, rivers, wells and other sources of fresh water were thought to draw the water from Abzu, while the ocean that surrounded the world was a salt water sea derived from his compatriot Tiamat. The two waters were thus always kept separate. So in conclusion, in ancient Mesopotamian mythologies, they believed fresh and salt water did not mix, just as the Quran makes the claim they do not mix. This claim is not true. Although there seems to be an observable slanted water barrier between them, however, eventually this barrier is broken and the waters from each sea passes to the other. In fact, there is always mixing of the salt and the fresh water, even at the boundary, as is required by elementary physics. When they pass the barrier, they lose their distinctive characteristics and become homogenized with the other water.
In other words, the initial barrier serves as a transitional, homogenizing area for the two waters. There is no such thing as an impassable barrier as the Quran claimed. Modern day scholars, experts, scientists and researchers understand the mixing of the two waters, examples of which are brackish water and estuaries. The Muslim apologists can never admit to this, as it is equivalent to becoming a non-Muslim. They have to continue making scientifically false propositions, because for them the Quran is the verbatim word of God, so no error is allowed. Even if an error is pointed out, casuistry is used to shift the goalposts by now saying the Quran was actually saying this, and how this is in conformity with science, even if the initial claim made by them was the polar opposite. The problem is Muslims are duty bound to accept what is evident in the religious texts first, then after reconcile that with any science they have to hand, even if it means to skew facts to fit it around the Quran. Clearly this is not the scientific method, at best it is ignorance, and at worst, it is disingenuous and deceptive.